economics. Uh, and welcome everybody. Thank you for having me here uh, to the business and, and breakfast. Uh, I'm sitting here in Davenport, Iowa right now, uh, but very familiar with the Glenwood, the Springs and uh, just the general county area. Um, I grew up in Boulder, spent a lot of time there uh, as a kid. So uh, kind of exciting for me to uh, to have that that connection. Not so exciting for you, but uh, <laughs> I got to tell my mom. So that was, that, you know, uh, that was cool. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen here, make sure everybody can see the presentation screen um, and just kind of get comfortable with the uh, with the presenting view. So um, Second Street is a software provider to uh, the media industry, among other businesses, um, that is uh, an engage that is basically engagement software for um, customers. And what we do is we help uh, many different types of businesses grow uh, databases of consumers. And so usually that's centered around an email list. Could be something like a text list or, or other types of databases, but usually the fundamental kind of um, piece of data, what we would call the primary key is the email address. And then we build profiles of other types of data associated with that around those email addresses that allow people um, to then do more targeted email uh, engagements with, with their customers. So we talk a lot about the engagement funnel. And, and for the purposes of today, I'm going to talk about how this has shifted uh, for local businesses over time, um, a little bit about their relationship to, to media as well. So when we talk about the engagement funnel, it's much like any other type of sales funnel um, that that you know, you may be aware of. Um, there are different models of, of this out there now, like flywheels, and but they're they're all basically about kind of moving uh, audiences from a, a wider top where there's a more general audience to somebody at the at the bottom who is very interested and probably primed for some type of purchase or even already a customer, and then into a retention cycle. Um, or into a, a, an ongoing relationship with a business. So at the top of the funnel, you have consumer experience. This is where people are engaging with um, sort of advertising, branded content, um, different uh, sponsorships, things that, uh, ways in which your business is sort of out in the community. Typically at this point, the consumer is anonymous to you. They're just able to sample, um, what your you know your brand and, and sort of the statements that your company makes uh, in the public sphere, and you don't have a whole lot of interaction. It's just sort of a, a general awareness of uh, of a business. The middle of the funnel, uh, as far as consumer experience, is that is then when um, some of those people become known to the business, and that is through. Um, email permission that is through different types of registrations that is some in some way. Uh, a customer is giving you their personal information and possibly their contact information allows you to start to know a little bit more about them and hopefully build data profiles that can lead to uh, personalization. And we'll talk more about what this means and try to break it down in a, in a more simple fashion because uh, honestly, like you can go a lot of different places with this. Uh, it's very easy to get caught up in, in, in the technology and the jargon of this. Uh, but, you know, at the end here, we're going to try to get this into some really actionable uh, insights for you. And then at the bottom of the funnel, you have somebody who probably has made a purchase. And at that point, you are looking to retain them as a customer, either to have them back at a set service interval or um, back on a regular basis. Really depends on the type of business that you are. If you're you know, a, a retail restaurant, you want people coming in really frequently. If you're auto service, you want them coming in uh, at, a, you know, at a more set interval that's a bit more spaced out. Um, but, but really, it's all about kind of making purchases and making repeated purchases. Um, and then if you're really lucky, you get to the advocacy part where people are giving you, you know, five star reviews on, on Google reviews or Yelp or, or you know, TripAdvisor, how uh, those types of um, word of mouth uh, endorsements from consumers that are so rare and so extremely valuable in the environment. Uh, so this has stayed relatively stable over time, but the methods with which 
all of this happens have changed really dramatically within the last 25 years. So if we look back to 25 years ago and kind of try to look at what's different versus the past, it's, it's instructive to look at something like purchasing a car uh, where in, you know, uh, the scenario where you're like, say, you know, 19, 1985 or 1995 um, and your car breaks down, you need a new car, you're at the top of the funnel, you're researching your options. Really what you see out there are signs on the street and advertisement in major local media. Um, a lot of different, you know, a lot of different forms. You may see uh, some, some magazine advertisements, some TV advertisements, billboards, signs on the street, but um, it's all very passive and you're just sort of experiencing it in, in quote unquote, the real world. Um, you may decide on, you know, sort of the criteria that you want. Uh, eventually, that's going to get you onto the lot, into the store, and then hopefully, uh, you know, closing a, closing a deal like young Marky Mark here. Um, but today, that has changed dramatically, where the ability to make your uh, research decisions as a consumer have expanded dramatically. And the opportunities to sample and research um, what a store or a brand has on offer uh, have exploded because of the internet. So you're no longer driving by, you're no longer experiencing this information piecemeal. And uh, this can also cut against, you know, just a primary like branding strategy where people know what they want before they go to the car lot. And, and I know that the dealerships will tell you this, a lot of times, you know, people are showing up with printouts from various services that help them research their purchases. And the negotiation is getting a lot tighter. Um, and, you know, the, the, uh, the time that car dealerships are spending with consumers who are ready to buy is a lot shorter. And that means that the consumer is really now much more in control than at any other point. Uh, in the purchase history of uh, you know uh, of automobiles, and, and this translates to a lot of different um, a, a lot of different industries, but it's very pronounced in situations like this, or like buying a house. Different areas where there's there are um, a ton of research options available online. So as far as businesses, businesses now have less control over their customer experience because. Um, the, the barrier to research is so much lower. And so you can't just put a billboard out there and do some you know, price and item advertising and, and sort of choose your message. The, the customer is receiving a lot of messages all of the time. And uh, they're also much, much more well-informed uh, than, they, than they have been in the past. So this funnel is becoming uh, extremely compressed and people know a lot more during their anonymous engagement uh, than what they have previously. They're starting to shift their, uh, so businesses are starting to shift their marketing to, and let's again, just continue with this automotive example, they're starting to shift their marketing into relationships with um, sort of research driven uh, companies and those companies have um, endpoints where they're looking for email addresses on a, uh, on a regular basis because they know that the key to these purchases is all about still starting that one-on-one -on -one relationship. Just a lot of times it's now happening in a virtual context. So uh, I'm just gonna flip back to that slide a second here. You'll see that there is uh, an email address there on a you know quote request form, but th this is all happening, you know, online. This is not happening, um, you know, with somebody walking onto the lot. Uh, a lot of a lot of this has been compressed and is happening away from kind of physical space. The key is still all about that one on one relationship. And it's really about what happens and how can you get folks into that middle of the funnel in order to then be able to surface the right types of offers for them. So that's kind of what's been happening over the last 25 years as the internet has kind of uh, wormed its way into all of our lives in very in very different ways, and you know it slowly started to kind of take over uh, to take over um, commerce in a lot of ways, uh, both big and small. And certainly, I mentioned some you know large purchase items like houses and cars, but it started to 
uh, you know, in, in fact, local retail in a lot of ways. And then in the last year, obviously, you know, the thing that we're all painfully aware of um, is that COVID-19 hit. And this has really accelerated these types of trends that the automotive industry has seen and the real estate industry and others uh, have seen those types of disruptions has started to come for smaller local firms um, in a really big way. So if you look at US uh, e-commerce pen penetration, the percentage of retail sales, it's been steadily kind of ticking up uh, since the early 2000s. And around 2010, it crossed the 5% barrier. Um, give it another, you know, give it another five years, it adds another 5%. Give it another five years, it adds about another 5% up until tw uh, 2019, where it was about 16% of, of all retail sales were happening online. And then we get to 2020 and you start to see one of those, you know, sort of disruption hockey stick type of graphs where it just takes off. And uh, you've, had a, you've had over 10% growth in terms of uh, per percentage of retail sales uh, in the in the last year, now this may correct once we're finally and hopefully through this cycle. Uh, this may correct a bit, but a lot of these changes are starting to happen, and they're not going to go away. So you're seeing a lot of this stuff, and right now it's a, it's all about you know safety and distance. But there's also a convenience factor here that everybody everybody has seen the writing on the wall as far as um, being able to do a transaction online and then pick something up locally. Um, but there hasn't been a real incentive to do that until, uh, or at least to do it rapidly until the pandemic hit. And now it's everywhere. You see the emergence of all of these middlemen, like you know, DoorDash and, and, and a, lot of, a lot of other delivery services in both the restaurant and retail space. So uh, this has been become the e-commerce vacation of this year has become the e-commerce vacation of local business where local businesses need e-commerce in a much bigger way than they ever have uh, in order to continue doing business. And I think that um, if, if folks are on the line here and they, and they run a, a small business, you know, we understand what you're going through. We've, we feel for you and, and, this is a dramatic, dramatic shift. Uh, and, and I think that, you know, that graph shows it in the abstract, but understanding it in the real world is, is a very different thing. Um, one of the biggest keys to success in the e-commerce space that all of these large retailers already know that I think smaller businesses are starting to figure out is still that one-on-one -on -one relationship. It just happens to be um, that you need a you know you need a way of reaching out to customers and email and and also uh, I will say you know SMS and and we can get into the differences during the, the question and answer but email is is really one of the best ways to do that um, it has a really really high return on investment compared to other types of digital marketing and that's because you're more uh, akin to sort of owning the relationship with people that you have their email addresses for than you do if you're sort of, you know, renting eyeballs on social media or paid search, you know, direct mail, all these other, these are all database marketing initiatives, but email and, and like I said, some somewhat SMS are the ones where you own the relationship more directly and are able to speak out when you have um, something to say at a much, much lower transactional cost than uh, other types of digital media. It's a really, really handy megaphone to have, um, and, but you, know, you have to do the work to kind of collect these relationships with folks. About 60% of small businesses have email lists that are smaller than 3,000. Now, 3,000 might be a, a great size of uh, email list for certain types of businesses in certain types of markets, but generally it's not, that's not that big of a list. Um, I work in media. The lists are, are much, much larger than that, obviously. Um, but, uh, you know, what we see time and time again is that a lot of small businesses are really focused only on kind of organic signups that happen in their uh, email signups that happen in their um, place of business. And they're not really tailoring their marketing as much towards driving, uh, towards driving email relationships with customers. And um, that is something that can really hurt you in an environment 
uh, like we're in today, uh, where you really need those relationships with folks where you know people aren't out and about shopping nearly as much and going into stores, you need a way to kind of uh, remind people of, of what you have on offer and to talk to them uh, at different, you know, different intervals. Uh, and that can get really expensive on social media or on search. Those are, those are different ways of reaching out. If you have a, a strong email list, then you're much more in control of your destiny. Um, so in, in terms of just what we're seeing, it's really still all about this kind of transitional moment where people move from this anonymous research and sampling behavior, and they move into a known, uh, you know, a, a known quantity um, as far as their relationship to the business goes and, and handling that and handling that on an ongoing basis is really essential to building your email list. Email is the number one driver of e-commerce uh, of e-commerce activity for most retailers not named Amazon. Um, and there's a good reason for that. It's a really, really mature technology. It's been around for decades. Um, it's decentralized and it's not owned by any one company. And so it's uh, a lot harder for gatekeepers to charge rents on email, uh, it's a bit more of a, a commodity. It's, re, it's return on investment, I mentioned is really, really high. Um, estimates as high as a, an average of $44 earned for every dollar spent on email marketing. Now that it, in, is entirely dependent on your execution. Uh, so your mileage may vary depending on, on business and depending on strategy. Um, and then finally, email has a lighter regulatory burden than other highly effective methods of, uh, of database marketing, in particular text messaging. Text messaging has really great engagement and it is fantastic as an outreach method, but it is also highly, highly governed um, by legislation. Email is becoming more so, but it's still nowhere near as restrictive as what you can do over SMS and your, your exposure to um, liability is, is, is still currently much lower uh, than it is with text-based marketing. So with, to make email really work, it's absolutely essential to capture not only an email address and permission to send, but then it also becomes really important to capture some sort of data to go along with that because everybody's inbox is crowded and people really are only going to respond to messages one, that they see, and two, uh, that are relevant to their interests at that moment. And that's a, you know, that's a bit harder to do, but um, it can be as simple as the example that I showed on the previous slide, and that's up again here, where, you know, this is um, people who entered into a, a recent uh, pizza sweepstakes at one of our media partners, and they gave their permission, and it's just sort of established through this engagement. This was a this was a sweepstakes that was attached to like a um, you know best local pizza uh, bracket um, online. These are the types of things that our company does. We we do we do things like brackets and contests and and you know different ways to get to kind of encourage people to um, to sign up for for email. Um, but this is a great example here of. A local business where right before the pandemic hit, they happened to sponsor this contest. They got a bunch of email addresses um, where they had permission to send to them. And these people had entered into a local, you know, a best local pizza um, kind of bracket competition. So they knew that they had product affinity. That was the only piece of data that they really needed, uh, in addition to having permission to send that help them then um, start to market their delivery and pickup business after the pandemic hit. Now, those are natural fits for a pizza business anyways, but it really, really uh, helped this you know, new business. They did not have uh, a, a substantial email list before this, and they happened to time it right. Uh, and it helped them keep their doors open during some really, really tough months uh, in the spring and early summer. Another example here of um, uh, you know businesses that have used software that we're affiliated with, but you know this one is is from uh, West Kentucky, and they were it was a, a lawn a lawnmower giveaway for um, you know sort of like a, a gardening uh, equipment type of retailer. Uh, they were really interested in finding in, to find people who were interested in 
buying outdoor equipment. So they gave away outdoor equipment. The contest immediately, uh, you know, sort of self-qualified to people who uh, have that product affinity again. And then they went a step further than that uh, and asked if it, not only do we have permission to uh, email market to you, but can we actually contact you for a sales opportunity? So out of everybody that entered, 161 of them said also, hey, yeah, you know, contact me, I'm interested. Um, so they gave away equipment valued at about $7,300. You know, that's a, a fairly significant outlay for, so, for, for some of us and for, for some of you on the line. But from the leads that they got from that 161, they funneled down to uh, six purchases in like the, I believe the month after this ran and were able to get about $43,000 in revenue. In addition to that, they have this database that is the gift that keeps on giving. They have hundreds of people that have now signed up for email marketing for this company that they can reach out to sort of ambiently on an ongoing basis and at a significantly lower cost than what they would do if they were reaching these people through social media or through search advertising, et cetera. Another example here on, on building um, a, a database. This is the great pave off. Uh, this is uh, a, some partners out in Rochester, New York. This is a photo contest where it was just, you know, show us your cracked driveway and for a, a chance to, um, you know, win uh, a, a, you know, a paving job, essentially. Um, again, self-qualifying uh, customers, you're not going to enter a contest for a new driveway unless you need a new driveway. So everybody except the winner of this contest is potentially a pro uh, prospect. Um, about 148 people opted in for this. 66 of them actually requested estimates uh, in the in the near future. So again, these are not just people that are looking for prizes. These are people that are looking for the the service is, is great, and if they win it, fantastic. But they need the work done, right? So um, this resulted in two hundred fifty thousand dollars in business booked. Again, this is all off of email lists. This is all off of putting the right offers out there so that you're attracting people in to sign up, uh, and then capitalizing on that by by using outreach and, and converting people to known and then finally one of our favorite examples um this is a, a solar uh a solar panel uh co consulting company out in springfield missouri um and they ran a significant campaign where they gave away solar installation again not not a small ticket item here uh but just to show you how these scale from a pizza shop all the way up to solar the same type of strategy works um, they had 22,000 entries, about 4,000 of those opted in uh, for, uh, for email marketing. And then they had a bunch of survey questions that qualified, you know, does your house have a south facing roof and, and a bunch of other things that actually qualified them for whether or not um, solar panel installation would work. They also had an opt in for uh, consultations in the, uh, in the, I believe six months after they ran this, the email addresses and the, the consultations that they had with these folks resulted in over a million dollars in new revenue for the business. And again, this is a gift that keeps on giving because these are now people that are captured prospects or captured potential consumers. Um, and they can be marketed again and again to until they, you know, until they exit the market or till, until they opt out of your marketing. So um, these are all just sort of examples of how building your email database can really drive significant business. Um, and, you know, whether or not that's in pandemic times or not, um, it gives you a leg up on competition because a lot of folks still are not paying enough attention to growing their own lists. Whenever they feel like they need to expand, they go back out to the well and they use forms of advertising that are great at gathering attention, but then they're not doing anything on the campaign side to actually collect that attention and to try to do something more with the people who are interested right at the time. So it's really, really key to like, no matter what type of marketing you're doing, you need to shift from a rental mentality to how am I going to own this audience over time? How am I going to own the right audience over time? So let's get into some more actionable stuff. That's kind of setting the stage. And um, I'm gonna take a drink of water here real quick and then we'll, we'll get through because these are, these are some important slides here. Okay, so the most important data that you could possibly collect uh, from consumers that, that uh, 
are, are registering with you in some way. So that could be on your website, at an event, however it is, is number one, get permission. I mentioned there's a lighter regulatory burden for email, but there is still a regulatory burden. You need permission to send to people and you need to respect their permission over time if it changes. So you absolutely need to tell them what they're opting in for and you know, as best you can, how frequently you'll be, you'll be sending things. The more transparency you can provide around the permission, the better, because it just establishes trust in the relationship that you'll have with them. Um, beyond that, looking for different types of dates that you can, um, you know, use to activate emails. So uh, a lot of our customers run birthday campaigns. They're highly effective because they're, some, they're somewhat personalized uh, to the individual, at least sent on the right day per year. But also look at things like anniversaries or last appointment, last service date. Um, if you, uh, let's take an example of, you know, a business that's in the pet space, or, uh, that's in the animal companion space. Um, if you're like a, a retailer or a, a, a service in the it, um, in that space, it's really helpful to know not only um, some information about the human, but it's also important to know, hey, when, when's your dog's birthday? Um, those types of those types of messages, like you know, happy happy birthday to Rover, are extremely effective at kind of breaking through the noise in the inbox. Um, and they're not particularly difficult or sophisticated in their execution. It just takes a little bit of it, it takes a little bit of forethought. Um, on on top of dates, knowing customer types is really important. So again, if you're in the pet space, knowing whether or not somebody has a dog or a cat or both, uh, or if they're if they're a bird enthusiast or if they have a lot of aquariums, those things allow you to tailor your messaging to different sets of your customers so that you're not just blasting the entire list every time you have a special on aquariums. If I don't have an aquarium, but I shop you know, with you for, for dog food and I keep getting email messages about aquariums, I'm going to opt out because my time is, uh, you know, is valuable to me. Um, and I'm either going to stop paying attention and you're going to get relegated to junk mail and eventually blocked by, you know, by me or by Gmail or something like that. Um, and you're just kind of wasting the opportunity. So keep your powder dry uh, and use these this type of data to only send to the people that it's going to be relevant to. And that's what we start to talk about, you know, um, relevancy and segmentation. Those are big words in, in marketing, but really what it means is, hey, be thoughtful about your communication and make sure you're sending to the right set of your customers or your prospects rather than just sending to everybody. And this is one of the biggest problems with, with SMB marketing right now is that having an email list is fantastic, but having an email list where you have the ability to then create smaller groups within that is much, much better and more effective. It keeps those email addresses fresh for longer um, and allows you to just be a better kind of partner to the consumer. Um, over time, builds that trust in that relationship, and that will lead to more revenue um, and a better, you know, long-term relationship with, with customers down the line. Uh, the last piece of, of data that you should be looking at collecting is just anything that helps your business that's not listed above there. Those are common types of data in terms of permission, in terms of uh, customer types, but usually with other types of businesses, there are a lot of um, there are a lot of other data points that you can collect. It's also worth noting that you can go nuts with data and segmentation and not really see a ton of benefits. So focus on really big categories that will actually like change the message that you're sending out um, and help your customer. Put yourself in the position of your customer receiving an email and think about, is this going to be relevant to all of my customers or only some? And if it's only going to be relevant to some, how do I get down to that list of, of you know, only the people that I want to reach. So some ways in which you can use this data um, and, and kind of highlighted in the data that you collect, but um, birthday emails, birthday emails are really just a great place to start for, for nearly all businesses because um, you can give, you know, you can give away something, you could do a, a birthday discount. It's a great way to run a, a small program that kind of personalizes messaging for your customers. Um, service reminders, if you're in a service business, and you want to, you know, you want to be reminding people six months out, three months out um, from their last appointment. It's a, those are uh, great, 
great places to start as well. And then again, those emails to specific interest groups, the, you know, uh, somebody that has a dog versus somebody that has a cat in their house versus uh, somebody that, that's a bird enthusiast versus somebody that is into, you know, reptiles or fish. All of those things matter a great deal. And if you're sending them the wrong message, uh, they're going to tune your marketing. Uh, they're going to tune your email marketing out. As an email marketer, your job is to get the next open from somebody. It's not to get this open right now and to drive short-term value. It is to drive a long-term relationship with your customer to supplement that kind of in-person uh, researching and sampling that is that is going away to a certain extent. So you have to be relevant to their interests if you've captured their permission and you have their trust. Being relevant to their interests uh, helps, you know, really helps you for the long term. You need to make sure that you're respecting permissions. So don't don't keep switching providers or sending people sending irrelevant emails to people. Um, you know, respect the permissions that they've given you, and then finally accept churn. Most email lists have will lose about 25% uh, of their value uh, of their of their volume. Sorry, over the course of a year, and either to opt outs and bounces and things like that, or to disengagement. People who are just going to completely tune out and stop paying attention. People who are, disen who are disengaged are much more dangerous to your email list than um, people who have opted out because they're just kind of sitting there and these, these email providers like Gmail and Yahoo and, and um, Outlook are looking at the engagement of, of mass emails that you're sending out. And if it is really low, they'll start to file you away as junk mail. That's how it happens. And it happens on a on sort of a one-to-one -one basis. And then also a more, a more broad reputation when you start a new email relationship with somebody. So accepting the fact that you're going to have that churn and you need to replace people in your existing list with new people who are more engaged and more interested in what you have to say is absolutely essential to maintaining the health of your email marketing efforts. Um, I hope that point is, is clear and please ask me more about it in the question section um, if you do have questions. So that's a lot of information. Obviously, I can, I can go deep on this stuff, but I'm just trying to give, give you all um, kind of a high level sense of, of why it's important to build your email list and then what you can do with those um, once, you've, once you've built them. Uh, but the key takeaways here, again, is critical to own your customer list and email is the key to unlocking that value most of the time because of its high ROI, low regulatory burden, um, and, and just the fact that it's not owned by one uh, particular company. So it's one of the best ways to own your uh, customer list rather than getting into this rental mentality of always going back to the well when you need to drive new business. Uh, most local businesses do not have a big enough email list uh, on it. And so you do need to find that growth and you need to find that from marketing campaigns. Um, and it, you should be structuring your marketing towards collecting email. So uh, if you're running advertising, what are you doing with those click-throughs? When somebody actually comes to your website or, or has some sort of engagement with you, you should be looking for all of the ways in which you can collect an email address and begin building a profile for uh, for a consumer off of that email address. Collecting that key customer data is absolutely essential to sending good email on a regular basis, making sure that you can separate the dog owners from the cat owners. Um, and then finally, maintaining your list growth is essential to your success. Uh, this is not a one and done thing. You do not just, you know, find your shoebox full of emails or run run one great contest and you know get a big list those things will sustain you for a little bit but over time you're going to see churn you're going to see entropy and you will need to continue to grow your email list in order to maintain its health and to maintain its effectiveness for your business so that's really it um i have a lot of experience in e-commerce email and i'm totally uh happy to you know, kind of go through um, your specific scenarios. I thought I would leave off examples of, of emails and, and talk to you more about your efforts here in the question section. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop talking and see what questions there are for me, if any. I don't, I'm not seeing any in the, uh, in the Q and A panel. Um, anyone uh, uh, raising their up? Oh, looks like there's a couple here coming in. Let's 
see. Okay, no, those are just chats with the interpreters. Um, any questions? If anybody out there has an email list and, or you know is currently running email marketing and want to ask specific questions about that, I would be happy to. Um, or if the uh, moderators have any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer those as well. Someone has raised their hand, so I'm going to allow them to talk. Okay. And I've never done this before, so we'll see how this works. John, you are able to talk. Tim? Oh. Yeah. Can you hear me? I can. My Thank name you. is John Rash. I own Rash and Son Carpet Cleaning in Glenwood Springs. I've been Great. here for 38 years and I left Iowa 38 years ago because of the, <laughs> of the weather that you're experiencing right now. Yeah, it's negative five. Yeah, well, uh, I my father and father-in-law both worked for John Deere in Waterloo and uh, uh, 55 years I've been doing this and I just got tired of Iowa weather, even though there's a lot of things I love sure. about I, Iowa, go Hawkeyes. But one of the <laughs> things in the, years that I've been in business, I've progressed from having a, a paper newsletter to keep in contact with clients. I've tried uh, all sorts of marketing, but I really, really think the importance of e-commerce and your discussion is very, very uh, applicable to especially a service business. Uh, um, trying to keep track of clients sending out uh, service reminders, uh, things of that nature or specials that you might be running. And uh, I really appreciate uh, your presentation and I'm glad there's still somebody in Iowa. <laughs> Thanks. Um, do, do, you have a, do you have a specific question for, um, for what, you're, what you're doing right now or, or um, how can, is there a way I can you know, give you anything beyond the presentation? Well, Tim, we're, we're a small company. Uh, and when I had never, ever looked at running specials with a request to retrieve email addresses, uh, I suppose uh, when, when we get a call in to the office for service, we're asking for email addresses to send invoices and get permission that way. Yeah. But uh, what, what are your thoughts about doing perhaps a, a special with uh, uh, door hangers or something like that, making a request for email addresses? Yeah. So, um, you know, one of the, the main things to think about with, um, one of the main things to think about for retailers and for service businesses is that one of one of the biggest drivers uh, for email signups is going to be the value that you receive, right? So for existing customers, it could be the value could be as simple as just like having a convenient place to receive receipts and invoices and things like that. But for for non consumers, for for prospects, um, a lot of times delivering some sort of value to them is what will get them sort of over the hump as far as giving your email permission. So that's why, you know, the company I work for focuses around things like sweepstakes or, you know, uh, quizzes and different things where people can kind of educate themselves or have a chance to win. There's some sort of value exchange happening there. Another really huge value exchange in the, in the retail and service space is discounts. Um, that is, I mean, you see this all over the e-commerce space. So you, just understand that as you're collecting email addresses, having a clipboard on your counter or, you know, um, collecting email over the phone with your existing customers, that's the lowest hanging fruit possible. And, um, other than that, you're going to probably have to give something away in the form of a discount, in the form of a giveaway, in the form of you know, information. You're going to have to give something away of value in order to receive those email permissions. So yeah, I think, I think um, you know, one, uh, offering a discount for signing up, um, offering one, some sort of one-time discount or limited discount for signing up is a great way to do it. And then, um, and then it's also an effective tactic for, you know, sort of moving customers to purchase is to send out uh, discounts. They have to be better than 
you know, what anybody could just negotiate on a, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So if it's, you know, if it's 10% off and that's not really a significant discount for your business, then you need to kind of think about what the offer is. But, but certainly um, that will work in both the context of driving signups and then also as content for, for email marketing to, to potential customers. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's see, a couple of questions coming in um, here. One um, from Julie, she uh, was asking if you build a campaign, um, do you have to bounce stuff or, or weed out bad emails? So um, most, and this will piggyback onto the other question I have, most email software that you can get for, you know, sort of small business marketing and emails should be weeding out the bad ones as you send. Um, usually the danger is the first send. So if you're loading in a list of kind of unknown quality, if it's like you collected these emails five years ago and you're not sure if they're good or not, um, that's going to be more of a problem. Like that will, in some cases, get you in hot water with, um, with email providers. If you send to an old list um, or a low quality list, they, uh, they have the right to, to just kind of ban you for services. So um, as you're getting started, it's kind of important to start with recently collected emails. And then over time, if you have some older ones that you want to try out, you know, you can, you can insert those in, but make, make sure that you have, um, make sure that you have permission and make sure that the emails are of good quality as you start sending. And then the software that you use should take care of the bad ones over time. There's even ways to segment out um, people who haven't engaged with your email in a specific amount of time. You know, you can set that to three months or six months or nine months, but, but those types of things um, will help you in the long term. And certainly anything that bounces or unsubscribes will automatically be removed. I have another question here about um, what program do I like best to send emails? Uh, Sega Street has its own <laughs> email service provider. Uh, we were, uh, so we think we're great, but we're also not really geared towards small businesses. Um, the question mentioned MailChimp and Constant Contact, uh, you know, Campaign Monitor, Iterable. There's a lot of, there are a lot of different email providers out there. Um, what I would, say is that the ones that are have a bigger brand preference uh, presence are usually um, some of the better ones to go with. They just have better infrastructure. Um, and a lot of them have a free tier that helps you get started at a small volume to kind of understand um, like the ins and outs of email marketing before your list gets gets huge. As your as your email marketing gets more sophisticated, you will find that you want more sophisticated tools. Um, as most of us do when we move from, you know, sort of a hobby to a specialization. Uh, and there are any number of email providers that will, um, that will help you with that. But the ones that you mentioned, uh, MailChimp and Constant Contact are both great. Um, I tend to prefer MailChimp, uh, you know, if I'm doing stuff uh, on a, on like a voluntary, volunteer basis with um, local businesses or, or local charities. But that's just personal preference. They're both very good at what they do. Uh, let's see here. Um, Lauren just sent me a question that says, uh, oh, she, no, sorry, she sent you all a question. What, what questions do you have about starting or improving your own email campaign? And I have a question um, while we sure. wait for some more to come in. Have you worked with nonprofits before? Um, just thinking about libraries, um, but it, nonprofits yeah. in general and, and what sort of like you say, you have to offer something, I guess, information is something that a nonprofit could do as opposed to, a, a, you know, a pizza party. Yeah. So let's, so, so let's take the, what, I mean, li libraries usually have a lot to offer in terms of the programming that they uh, provide. So there's a natural hook for an ongoing kind of engagement um, campaign. Uh, for libraries in terms of what you send out like that's just almost not a problem libraries are producing a ton of content um that will engage with people who who sign up with you um in terms of driving signups um having signups in the library is absolutely important and then also you know think about driving that advocacy piece so um, a lot of the work i think that's interesting in the nonprofit space is like driving driving signups for volunteers or driving donations and a lot of that we're seeing um really 
happens in, in trying to kind of sign up and develop uh, advocates because kind of peer to peer um, email marketing works very well. So can you, can you get somebody to enlist 10 of their friends, you know, in, in a current initiative or something like that? Like that's a, those are usually really good endpoints for the, um, for the nonprofit space. There's a lot of different what you can do just a straight up donation drive, um, which is much more similar to e-commerce, you know, hey, we're having our annual fundraising campaign, you know, here's, here are, you know, two buttons for preset donation amounts, et cetera. So, um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of di different directions you can go. And, and Lauren, I, I hope I answered your question, but the, it's like, it's a pretty wide open space. Um, let's see here. If you work with large companies, what is the threshold of a business size that could work with me on an email campaign? <laughs> Um, I'm an on I'm an on staff consultant, so I only work with um, Second Street's customers. Um, we so basically I I am just a resource that's available to um, customers that that are that are, uh, Second Street was just acquired by Upland Software, so uh, a customer of Uplands is a customer of mine. Um, otherwise, uh, otherwise I, I'm not a on the um, on the private market, but I would be uh, happy to take your contact info and either put you in touch with um, with people that do, or um, you know, just point you to some some resources online uh, that that can help you out. Um, I will say the reason that I'm here is is uh, through the uh, paper in, in Glenwood and and. Uh, Swift newspapers that own them is a big partner of ours, and they are definitely worth talking to. What other questions can I answer for y'all? Looks like there might have been a question from Donnie Cochran, but I, I'm not I'm not quite sure what the um, question is. It just says a few of us missed this. Please put in chat. Um, well, is there anything that I can recap? Okay, good deal. Well, uh, Lauren and Alex, thanks for having me. I uh, really appreciate it and, and great to uh, connect virtually with um, the site of, of many fulfilling, uh, oh, best, best way to connect. Okay, um, I, I will just give you guys a straight up, my email address is tim.davis at secondstreet.com. So if you guys wanna reach out, I will try to put you in touch with some uh, resources that can help you out. And Bryce, thanks. Okay. Yeah. Alex, Lauren, and, and also Bryce, thanks for having me. Um, and uh, go Glenwood. We'll uh, go Garfield County. <laughs> go Rifle, go Eagle. We'll, uh, we'll see you guys later. And uh, thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tim, for doing this. We really appreciate it. Um, I did want to take a second, since you mentioned the Post Independent, um, to just just a reminder that the Business and Breakfast um, exists because of a partnership between Garfield County Libraries and the Post Independent, the Glowman Springs Chamber, um, CMC, Business uh, Blizzard Press, and uh, uh, River Blend. Um, even though we don't get to enjoy their lovely food right now, hopefully we will soon. Um, so thank you again, Tim. And um, we hope to see you um, next time, next month at the next Business and Breakfast. Thank you so much. Thanks very much.